Well, we're here again. We tried this. Let's try this again. We're yeah. having some serious, serious issues with technology at my house. My mouse has gone to poop. Uh, I had to get another, uh, whatchamacallit, keyboard. keyboard. Yep. So, happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patty's Day. So, we're going to... Um, Hopefully, everybody comes back. Yeah. There they go. Silliness. Silly. It's so crazy. Oh, the only thing I do is switch to my phone. And then I read all the comments up on the... The screen. The screen. So, welcome. We'll start completely again. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Love St. Patrick's Day. If any of you are in Ireland, woohoo! And you all have to think we're probably crazy over here for everything we end up doing during St. Patrick's Day. I've got to believe. I've got to. We are crazy over here, though. Yeah. Last weekend, we went to um, Chicago, saw the river turn green, which was awesome. It was fun. So, uh, it was a beautiful weekend. I'm Carrie the Mortician. This is my boyfriend, Josh, who also is a certified crematory operator, 27 years doing burial, burial vault vaults. installation. And I've had some of you kind of not yell at me, but say, why do you always say burial vault? It's not like everybody can afford burial vaults and use them. Vault is a universal term for anything a person has put in to be buried. So whether it is a grave liner or a ceiling vault, yep. it's all vaults. It's all precast concrete. It's all generalized words. So I'm not no. uh, discriminating against those that use <laughs> grave liners. Um, so today I have my first sponsored cup of coffee. So on my website, on carrythemortician.com, you can go to the Coffee with Carrie and put in a topic you want me to cover during the video. Um, but you can also sponsor my cup of coffee. So today's in my you are everything I ever wanted mug. Uh, Joseph or Bansick sponsored my cup of coffee today. So thank you, Joseph. So let's dive in. You guys sent me a topic last week or this last week. Several of you sent a news article about a crematory that uh, they found a whole bunch of dozens of sets of remains. And how naughty it is. And it was a huge news story. Something I really want you guys to remember is just because there's cremated remains at a business, at a funeral home, or a crematory does not make that illegal. Nope. They're abandoned all the time. Mm. People don't pick up their loved one. Saw it a lot. They just don't. So if there's sets of cremated remains there does not mean it is illegal. If they have sets of cremated remains but the family was given something else. That's bad. That's bad. If there's human full body remains there that are not being stored properly until cremation, they're not in a cooled area, they are extenuated period of time, extensive period of time, then that's naughty too. Yeah. You have to store them properly. Um, or if there's a body that had been cremated already and something given to the family, that's bad. Think back to Tri-State Crematory down in Georgia, circa, when was that, around 2000-ish, 2000 2001? Yeah. Um, and they had like 300 sets of remains found in parts, pieces, and such that yeah. people had been given the wrong. Um, check out my naughty funeral director video. It talks about that. Um, but just because media spins things terrible, that yeah. remains were cremated remains were found at the funeral home, that doesn't make it bad. So there are more viewpoints and there are more is more information to a lot of media stories when it comes to funeral homes and funeral directors and stuff. Um, so thank you for sending them so we can put a little different spin on them. Yeah. So. Is that right? I've never I, I seen a know. statistic ever. I don't know. On that. So I don't know that there's an actual tracking of it to know um, how much, how many are actually abandoned. So uh, if you guys have questions, let us know. Um, anything about vaults, cremation, funerals, caskets, 
you name it, drop us your questions. Uh, I'm gonna cover a couple questions that had been given via email. And um, let's see, we had one from Ed. Uh, Carrie, have you ever had a chance? Sorry, this one's from actual the question stream. Have you ever had a chance to visit the body farm? No, it is on my top three yeah, things cool. I want to do, and um, it's on my vision board. Like, this is a thing, so it will happen at some point. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. So, uh, Ed asks Is it possible for a funeral director to unlock the phone of a deceased individual using facial identification? Oh, that's a good one. There are a lot of disappointed families that think this is a routine procedure. Have you ever tried this before? And if so, were you successful? I have never had to try this, but I know that I've had people say, you know, they're bringing in their phone, there's no way to unlock it, and ask if the visual, you know, the facial could be done. The face would have to be eyes, you know, the eyes and the mouth in its normal positioning. This is normal dead person position, eyes open, Mouth open. Mouth open. Yeah. So we would have to close it to scan the face with the <clears throat> phone. Yeah, theoretically, it should work. I don't think it has any heat sensitivity to it, obviously. Um, we could also use the thumb, you know, the fingerprint to unlock something. But then it goes, who has the right to? You know, who's bringing the phone in to try and get this done? And do they have a right to do this? Yeah. So those are questions also. It may be something legality-wise the funeral home may not want to do. I would say, though, if like, uh, you know, just a simple situation where, you know, somebody brings in their spouse's phone and says, you know, I just want to unlock this to contact their family, you know, their friends and let them know that he's died or something. I can't see any problem with it, but um, it's interesting. It is. Uh, I was on a podcast called The Domino Effect of Murder a while back. Um, Jan Canty is the, um, Dr. Jan Canty is who hosts that podcast. And she reached out just to let me know. She has a new book out to tell you guys. Um, it's called What Now? Navigating the Aftermath of Homicide and Suicide. So for the survivors. Uh, it is out now. It is on Amazon. So check that one out. The body farm, so this is a uh, farm of study, essentially, that's typically connected to a school where they're studying decomposition and um, rate of death. And Big so, one's down in Tennessee. Yeah, uh, down there is kind of the original where Dr. Bass started it. And bodies are donated to medical science. Then they are placed in a varying positions under things, in things, um, embalmed, not embalmed, different manners of death, to see how that body reacts over a certain period of time. They have cameras on them, they have students and faculty that track them every single day, every however many times throughout the day, depending on the study. But time is of the essence. So they can't have a you know five-day dead body that they're then gonna put in a position because what where that body has been up to that point is affected by that. So they have to be ready to take that body in and put them in that position right away. Super fascinating. It's it um, forensic anthropology driven, a lot of it. But yeah, super fascinating. It's really neat. Yep. So Kayla asks, I'm considering going to mortuary school to become a funeral director. I've got three kids under 12, so I'm worried that if I'm a funeral director, I won't be able to see them or be able to attend their school activities. I know you're a mom too, and I'm wondering if you have any advice. Have you found it is hard to balance family life, being available to your kids, and working in the funeral business? So I have not found it difficult. This is because of the employers I have. Yep. So if you go to a funeral home that you're expected to work the visitation or calling hours, or you're on call during the night and you have to go out, or you know wherever the scenario, that's going to affect your quality of family life. If you work for a place that you don't go out on the removals, you don't embalm at night, you don't have to work calling hours, there's people who do that, and they really focus on you just having a good 40, 50 hour a week work week, and it's balanced across everybody. That's great. So it depends who you work for. Understand that the best jobs are probably ones you have to leave to go to get. It's not gonna be within a half hour of your home. These, Jobs are not 
popping up. You know, it's not like there's a, ch a churn of jobs in terms of, you know, your local family director is not going to change positions every five years. That person's hopefully there for the duration of their career and there may be only one position there. So you have to move to jobs and there are amazing job opportunities. So people throwing crazy money and benefits and things at funeral directors right now to try to get employees. Going to school, no, move, move to the job. Do not plan to just stay where you are. I understand that's hard. Thank you. Okay. Um, I understand that's hard if you have a family. It's harder when, you know, maybe your spouse or partner is solidified in their job. So it is definitely challenging. There's one. The most elaborate vault I have ever done or heard of. Now, when I was doing burial vaults, I did do, because they get ordered in all kinds of different paint schemes, different colors, and I was responsible when I wasn't out on the road doing funeral setups for working in the physical plant, and I did paint a lot of burial vaults and do a lot of, you know, decorating, painting, getting them ready to take them out. Uh, the most elaborate ones that I have done that took the most time were camouflage vaults, a camouflage pattern, because you have to, there is no stencil, there is no anything like that, you did it by hand, so... I would start with one base color, usually black, and lay it down. And then over the top of that, you would do tans, grays, greens. You would have to physically hand paint them. I mean, the covers and the base itself. So probably camouflage, which I mean, when they were done, they were super neat looking. But yeah, it was, uh, it took a lot of time. Yep. So how does weight contribute to the cost of cremation? Most crematories will have a point where at a certain weight, they will charge more yeah. for the cremation. And it's not because they're penalizing the person. It's because you're using more gas. It takes more time. Uh, just everything involved, it costs more for us to do it. And the, I know the weight limit, it, when I was working at the crematory, it was 450 pounds. If you're over 450 pounds, then there's an extra fee added on to it because... It's usually a solid hour to two hours longer to cremate that person completely. And it affects the order of how the day is laid out. Yep. So if you're in a casket, you're going to want to, what do you do first or end of the day? Well, normally the, the, the heavier ones and the bigger ones or the solid wood caskets that burn real hot, we would start them out and do those the first cremation of the day. And then after that, you want lighter bodies for the rest of the day because it will overheat that machine. So you would want to get started out when the machine is as cold as possible. Of course, you've got to bring it up to a certain temperature before you can start the cremation, but you still want the machine to be as cold as possible when you start it. So first one of the day. And usually when they're real big, having only one unit in the crematory that I worked at, you could only burn one big body a day. And then you might get... I mean, depending on how long you stay there, you could get another eh, two or three bodies burn in a 10 hour day, probably just depending on how long, you know, that one took. So, yeah. And, you know, babies, same thing. You're going to do them a certain time in the day, but when yeah. someone is heavier, you don't walk away from the machine like you can no. with a smaller person because of the um problems of you could get a grease fire you can overheat the unit there's all these reasons yep. and so there is a, a charge and depends on the crematory i've seen some that'll charge more at 300 some at 500 it it just depends mm -hmm. so thank you guys for all the compliments yes. yep my shirt she looks beautiful magically delicious I did i curled my hair today so thank you guys yep and i will add to doing the bigger bodies and you know babies stuff like that once you get used to your machines that you're working and you kind of get a feel for them when you do a few big bodies and you kind of see how the machine reacts and how things go you, you get a pretty good feel for it and you know what you can get away with with that particular machine but yeah when you're doing babies or big bodies yeah i, I would never walk away i mean <laughs> Th thanks, Christine. <laughs> Said I look pretty. She too. lives in Kalamazoo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, I'm looking funny. pretty rough right now. I got up, went to the gym, and then came back here and <laughs> sat down with Carrie. So, um, I claim the cremains of my friend that 
were at a funeral home for 13 years. The bill was unpaid, did not have to pay, had to sign a document that I claimed her. That's most people at funeral homes at this point want, if they've been, if they have sets of cremated remains that have been there a while, they want someone to just take those cremated remains to care for them. If the family's not going to, or you can find some extended family. I mean, I, one funeral home I went and worked at, um, that was one project I worked on was trying to get the cremated remains into the hands of family. And some were from the fifties and sixties. So I was tracking down generations and trying to get somebody that would want to care for them because we would rather they be in the hands of someone. Yeah. And at that point, we can't collect money from a bad debt from, you know, 30, 40 years ago. It's not always about the money at that point. Like the money's already done. It's gone. It's, it's getting them into the hands of yeah. a family member. What is done with inside organs after death? So we don't take, we don't take as funeral directors and bombers, we don't take any body parts out. We don't take out organs. We don't take out um, like the brain or anything. That is done during the autopsy and then everything is sent with the body to the funeral home. If we're embalming a standard body, non-autopsied, we're gonna aspirate the cavity, which is the chest, the abdomen to try and get out. We suck out fluids and things um, that are in there that cause bacteria growth and that's what decomposes the body and then we treat it with chemical that's what we do during embalming with the internal organs body farm oh yep down in tennessee i did my fourth removal last weekend with a friend who owns a funeral home definitely oh the courage to do it to carry in this channel. That's oh, awesome, nice. Leo. Oh my gosh, that's exciting. Yay. Josh, if you got a 400 pound person and you have to put in a hillside, like doing a burial on the side of a hill is I'm assuming what you're asking. Yeah, there's, when you're doing burials and burial vaults and setups at the graveside, it's it's an art form. I mean, you just kinda, you kinda learn it as you go, but yeah, there's ways to get down to it and what I would have to do, if it's on the side of a hill, first, I have a lot of blocking. I would have uh, aluminum planks, like heavy-duty aluminum planks that could handle a lot of weight. And I would use usually, I had some aluminum planks for my end boards too, but you want to get the board spread out away from that grave hole as far as you can, and you'd block it up. And I had a level with me, like a small hand level, and I would get down and brace it all up real good and level it off. And then I would drive my truck or my, they call them a, a vault cart or a vault jenny, but it's a motorized trailer with the burial vault on it that I would tow behind my truck. And I would drive that down to the grave and get it close and pull the crane way from that out and set it on those planks, make sure everything's solid make sure the weight's gonna be distributed evenly. And then I had a hydraulic hoist. When I first started, I had a chain fall for the first few years. And so there was more manual labor to it. But either way, you pick the vault up off the trailer, slide it out over the grave hole where your boards are set up around and lower it down in. But you know, sometimes if it was on too steep of a hill, yeah, we would have to use a either a, a boom truck, a four wheel drive, you know, knuckle boom truck or Sometimes the cemeteries would have backhoes, and if you were knew them well enough and in good enough with the sexton that took care of the cemetery, a lot of times he would set the vault for you, and you would do a fault set up off to the side where it was flatter so the family could still come in, carry the casket in, set it on the lowering device. The lowering device would just be sat on the ground, and I'd have my curtains around it so you couldn't see if there's a grave or not really underneath it. And then after that, you'd have to have either the sexton or somebody else help you you know, load the casket into the burial vault, you'd seal it all at once, and then you'd set it with a backhoe. I mean, there's different ways to do it. Sorry, I was rambling. <laughs> I got into burial vault mode. <laughs> he does get excited when he talks about burial vaults. I, I did it for a long time. Um, Sharon says, the story about the priest. The court system found him guilty after his death. So part of my Murder at the Funeral Home series, um, one one of them posted yesterday for Dixon Funeral Home, but the previous one that had posted was about the priest in Wisconsin that went in and killed uh, the funeral director and the apprentice. And he ended up um, taking his own life. But uh, Sharon saying that the court system did find him guilty after his death. So thank you. I'll have to go look and find that 
follow up. I never saw that in the researching. Is the casket and vault set level in the ground or with a slope of a hill? Usually they will dig it so it sets level in the ground. So like if you're on a hill, yeah, one end of the grave is going to be a lot higher up than the other end. If you catch my drift, you know, it's at an angle. It's going to be level because you have to set it level, especially if you're going to put a lowering device over the top of it. Because if that burial vault's kicked like this and your lowering device is level on the top, that casket is not going to go into that vault, right? You're going to have trouble. So... Carrie, have you ever had a Holocaust survivor with a tattoo on the forearm that you cared for after death? Hmm. We have had um, people that have had tattoos that were from um, the area at the time. Never said that they were in a concentration camp and released or anything, but definitely... Um, people who uh, escaped out of Poland and had things happen and from Germany and um, different areas actually just recently had a family share a very intimate story about stuff that happened to their mom when she was over wow. in that area during that time. But nobody that has specifically said, you know, X, Y, Z. So have had... Uh, a lot of interesting exposure to people and interesting stories around that time frame over there. Scott says, my sister-in-law recently passed. Your live chats and videos helped us through the cremation process. We knew what to ask. That's that makes awesome. me so yeah. happy when you guys share these stories. Not that you've had a loss, but that you felt empowered. You felt like you knew what to ask. You felt confident rather than being so scared, not knowing, lost in the process. Like that is what the purpose is, is you just feeling good about what you're going to do because you've thought through things, you know questions to ask, yeah. you know red flags to look out for. There are naughty family directors, but it's not the majority. It's definitely a minority. It's a, it's a minority, yeah. Um, so it be, it's nice to, to know that even just a few people are feeling empowered going to do what they need to do. Yeah. So, um, Josh, have you ever had to move any vaults remains due to corrosion on the land from water? Has happened to a few cemeteries in Vermont where things were becoming visible on the embankment. Not here in Michigan. I mean, the only time that I have ever had to do any exhumations or move remove burial vaults have been either for... Murder investigations where they want them dug back up. And in that case, I'm not responsible for actually digging them up. That's whoever takes care of the cemetery. But we would show up and they would usually dig down to the top of the burial vault. And then me or me and somebody else I worked with would have to jump down in and you dig around the edge of the burial vault so you can get a sling around it and then you pull it out. Um, murder investigations... If somebody wants a, uh, a loved one moved to a different state, because sometimes people will move to different states, and they will have their loved one exhumed and moved down to wherever they're at and reburied in a cemetery close to them. Disinterred. Disinterred, yes. Exhumed is for, oh, yeah, we learned sorry. from Sharky, sorry. exhumed is for a legal purpose. Yes. Disinterred is, is just because. <laughs> just because the family wants, yeah. So. Yeah. Um. I brought these one to show you guys. I've talked about Parting Stones. So Parting Stones is the name of the company. Look it up. They take cremated remains, and through this process, they uh, through a process, they turn all the cremated remains into a beautiful box of stones. And so you get back this box of stones. Cool and looking. It is a reversible process, which I think is the most insane thing yeah, that, is. oh, if you really don't like your stones, you can reverse them back to cremated remains. But so like these are some cremated remains, nondescript, no idea where they came from. It's just a sample that they give so you can kind of show. So would you rather get back this or would you rather get back a stone? And those are super smooth. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're, they're neat. They're really neat. All different shapes, all different sizes. Oh. I think this is what I want to do with my dog that we cool. disinterred. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I just think these are cool. And like I had asked when I interviewed those guys if 
you know, I throw this in water, is this going to dissolve down? Like, is it going to break apart? And they're like, no, this is what it's going to be forever. So if you want to cast your loved one into different rivers, different lakes, they are going to be whole. They're not going to disperse out in the water. I kind of like that rather than scattering. It's neat. Yeah. You can see and you know that they're there. So this is parting stones. Which would you, which would you rather have back? Love it. Yeah, I think they're neat. Love it. Yep. Set this back over there. Um, yeah. What else? So after this video, we are going to jump over to the Ick Factor channel because we did, Josh did his DNA. <laughs> we were sitting at dinner one night and we're like, Could be scary. he's like, I wonder what, you know, like what my ancestry is. And so I was like, well, Jun 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 ordered up a DNA test. I've, I've already done mine, but. I, I think I know because I've had some fa older family members that have been big time into genealogy and have tracked, you know, family history, at least on one side. But that's just on the one side. So my mom's side, I'm, I am I know quite a bit. I guess I do on my dad's too, but yeah, it's just going to be interesting. Something I thought, hey, we can do it. So we'll find out. Yep. And I've already done mine. So we're going to talk about kind of our ancestry. And P.S. I'm a bit Irish. Yes. Never realized. Uh, um, and just kind of go over that. So I always say, you know, people assume they know where they're from and who they are in terms of, you know, genetically. You might know what your family tree says, but those might not really be your family members. Right. You don't know. So, and I've encountered Things this happen. with the girl's dad. Um, yep. He did it and um, found a whole family that he was connected to because, you know, it just happens that maybe your pa parent is not who genetically gave you parts <laughs> and there may be other people and you may yeah. have other family you're connected to and it's quite shocking, but it does happen. Yep. Um, so... I don't know. It's so we'll to, see. Fun we'll see to if look I'm into. shocked or not. Fun to look into. So any last questions, you guys, on this happy St. Patrick's Day where it's raining and dreary here? But I uh, once saw a YouTube you did. It was a thing they used to carry cremated remains. I forgot the name of it. Hmm. Oh, for like carrying like from the hearse over to the grave or whatever. It's called an ark. An yeah. urn arc, and it holds them in the middle and has can can't. I don't know what word you're looking for, but it it looks like the carrying bars. Is yes, what I was it, going it for. Look, if you ever watch Indiana Jones, they look like the the little like Ark of the Covenant thing where they were carrying. Yeah, I can't remember which Indiana Jones it was, but that's what that reminds me of because I've seen those a few times too. <laughs> um. Ancestry has amazing migration patterns based on DNA and it updates the more people they submit DNA. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, amazing, it's Leo. It is. Last time I shook my family tree, a bunch of nuts fell out. <laughs> I, yeah, well. Are you still living abroad? Nope, never lived abroad. I, did, I visited England and worked over there for a few days. But no, I haven't ever lived abroad. Oh, I have an appointment with hospice this afternoon. Moving from palliative care to hospice sooner than expected. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But they are going to be an integral part of your journey. Um, hospice is very supportive and hopefully supports your family and you through through all of it. When will your next live chat be? Um, I don't know. I used to have these scheduled and do them the same time, same day every week, but then I found I was missing a lot of people from different time zones. So I throw them in in the evening sometimes, sometimes in the morning. Just depends. Oh, it's Crestlawn Cemetery in Atlanta. Hmm. I will have to do that at some point. So is it normal to be afraid of funeral homes and cemeteries? Yes. The two greatest fears in the world are public speaking and death. And to us, funeral homes and cemeteries reflect death. And so they are triggering for that fear. Yeah. And I'm around death all the time and I public speak all the time. So who, who, what crazy lady am I? Um, so it is a very, very, very common fear. I'm afraid of, you know, death. I'm not afraid of funeral homes and cemeteries, but 
Are burial vaults mandatory for burials? Well. Um, the bottle man wants to in, know. Yeah, in, in most places they are. So that's yeah. not a law no, but in many places. Some states it is, but... Most of the time it's it's township to township. But in Michigan, I can tell you, I don't know of anywhere will there, where they will allow you to be buried without a burial vault. Unless it's a um, for religious, yeah. um, Jewish, Muslim, or if it's in a green burial cemetery that they're switching to um, non-vault areas. But they're doing them in sections where you can't just put a body with no vault in the middle of no. a vaulted section just because you're going to then get this dip in the grave. Yep. So they're controlling what areas so that they can control the integrity of the cemetery as well through it. Yep, that's a big reason why. Do you have to be embalmed? No. no. <laughs> it is not a law anywhere that you have to be embalmed. Funeral home may require that you have to be embalmed for a public viewing or if your body's being held for a certain duration of time. In some states, they have law that does say within so many hours, you have to either be in a specific temperature regulated space, embalmed, cremated, or buried. So they can dictate some of that, and that is in law some places, but there is no one law anywhere that says you have to be embalmed. But yes, it might be a requirement of the funeral home or if a certain period of time is, is passing. Um, we are actually going on a road trip. Yep. Um, the fam here is our little blended non-official. Um, Josh, me, and all of our kids are going to be headed down to the Blue Ridge Mountains um, in a couple of weeks, and so well, really excited about that. Um, we'll be down in northeast Georgia, yep. yeah. And then, and so I don't know if we're gonna do videos down there, we may look into some different cemeteries and things and may do a couple videos. I'm sure we'll do a live video from down there or something too. I don't yep. know yet, It'll but be the same area that Braden and I did our. Blue Ridge Witch video on the Ick Factor here last year. Yep. So we're excited about that. <laughs> okay, Raphael, I love talking about this question, so I will answer it for you, and that'll be my last question. I'm concerned about drinking water. Don't embalming fluid leak after burial? So um, I've gone to a water treatment facility because blood and all of it goes down the drain. At the, at the funeral home. So I wondered how much is the water source infiltrated by the chemicals? And in parts per trillion, embalming chemicals aren't found, but you know what's found? Household cleaner chemicals, hormones, medication that everybody's on. That is what is left in the water after treatment because they are so strong. The water won't break them down. They can't break them down by their yeah. processes. So that is what is there. So a body that's in a casket, in a vault, under the ground, I am not concerned about even a little bit that they're leaching into the water, yeah. leaching into the water table. Because what you are putting in the water in your personal home is doing far more damage than that body in the ground in my opinion, yep. and from the state, the data that I have been shown from the water treatment places. Pesticides and fertilizers and... All of that. Yep. So, yeah, I would be more concerned about changing your own habits maybe. Um, oh, man, I said I wasn't going to answer more. So, Becky, you are bringing great questions. My friend used her husband's cremated remains to do a tattoo. These are going to be ejected from her body. That's what I was just thinking when I saw that. So cremated remains, yep. ink is liquid. Cremated remains are granules. Even the smallest particles of cremated remains are still granules. Think about taking your arm and rubbing it on sand and pressing sand into your, your skin. If you then let that go, it's going to heal and your body is forcing that out. Her body is going to force out the cremated remains because it does not want them in because they're grains within her skin. So they're going to be gone. 
Um, this is a, you know, maybe there's a little bit that may have gone Left into there. her that might be part of his cremated remains, but more than likely they're getting ejected. So it's a beautiful thought, but over time it's, it's ejected from your body. Yep. Um, what about my book, Carrie? Dang it, James. You know, I would like to to focus on that here at some point. <laughs> I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It's it's taking and putting things in its place right now in my world and finding my time. And um, I had some big things coming up uh, that I finally just got done, which feels really good. I got up most days between four and four thirty the last two weeks just to get a bunch of projects done and turned in. And so I'm Carrie's feeling, super busy all the time. Oh, I've been really cranky cause I've been really tired and <laughs> no feeling, <comment. laughs> feeling really stressed, but, um, got them done. Yes. Got there. Got there. Proud of you. So looking forward to our trip. Um, yep. we do have a meet and greet this weekend in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. So if you want to join from two to four on Saturday, uh, a crematory up there. We're going to be doing a meet and greet and um, crematory tour. If you'd like to join, email me at carrie at carriethemortician.com. I'll give you all the details. Um, thanks, guys. Thank and you. And thanks to Josh for joining. I'm glad we were yeah. hanging out today. Thanks for having so me. So we could do this. But thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patty's Day. Join us over at the Ig Factor while we do um, some DNA stuff. So, bye guys. <laughs>